Good morning, great ones. This is Professor Gaunt, Dr. Gaunt, coming to you live from my home studio and broadcasting from my YouTube channel, Curiosity, K-Y-R-A. O-C-I-T-Y, Kira of the City Curiosity. I want to talk to you today about remembering your CT training, and I'm going to share with you some of the comments from your peers back in March, around March 9th. Since the age of consent is different states to states or country to country, if we were to do research online showing videos of children, does that violate any consent clause? Will we have to blur or pixelate the children's faces? That's something to speculate as you put together a final blog or create a two-minute blog of your first round of results. Here's another comment. In the best interest of the subjects, we as student researchers shall protect their identities as needed and do no harm to their well-being or reputation. When doing research, it's important to be able to balance telling someone's story without skewing how they see the situation or revealing their identity. One part of this lengthy set of readings that stuck out to me was the part about Nancy Sherper Hughes and her research. She did research and tried to present it in the most objective way she could, which was based solely on what she witnessed while she lived in a poor village. She described in her essay how mothers seem to be desensitized to the fact that their newborn babies died almost immediately. We found out this is due to poverty conditions. To the villagers, however, it seemed as if they were being looked at like uncivilized people who encourage infanticide. In addition to that, the people themselves knew exactly where in the essay they were mentioned because she didn't fully protect their identities. So the student goes on to write, what, what's more, they were even able to figure out when their relatives and neighbors were being mentioned. This shows how, even as careful as one is when they are presenting their works for the public, oftentimes subjects themselves are excluded from this audience. Brilliant. Make sure you remember that the girls that you're talking about are included in the audience of your findings. Be respectful. Do not damage their reputation. Do not treat them like they're primitives or sexual fiends or doing something wrong. Most of us, in all situations in public, think we're doing the thing that is best or normal or considered um, valued in public. And often we learn from our mistakes when those things cross those boundaries. I think my biggest zero is that I'm not as aware of my surroundings as I should be. I felt like I learned a lot of things and how we need permission to get information from others and who controls the situation. How do we get proper consent on YouTube? This is such an important part of whatever we intend to publicize or release from our findings. I feel as though I took the principles of confidentiality and privacy for granted and just assume that researchers didn't really have to worry about these kinds of things. Similar to how signing a release form, oftentimes people don't read the full form when you agree to update your app or on your computer. You don't read the full agreement. Now I realize that collected data and performing research has far more subtleties than I thought, and it's important to think about the perspective of the party being researched to try and ensure that there is no intrusion. However, when it comes to openly available online data like YouTube videos, the rules are much more hazy. I believe this training was important because YouTube is a gray area that has lots of privacy issues. These girls didn't upload videos so that undergrads could study their culture, but they did upload the videos into the public sphere, so it's a weird mix of this is okay, and this is not okay. However, the training shows us how to do research and do no harm. Number seven, <laughs> I'm losing track. I think training was actually quite valuable. We're going to code YouTube videos of teenage girls twerking. We have to treat them with respect while we do digital ethnography that includes their videos. Perhaps, that's up to you. Whatever their motive for putting the video up on the internet, we must make sure that we do no harm to their reputation and their identity. The training was valuable because it effectively conveyed the importance of keeping the human subject in mind. Start with the people. While YouTube videos can be made private, I'm assuming the videos we'll be studying will be public, and some of them 
were taken down from the public sphere, when you're taken out of the public sphere, when you're removed from the public sphere as a human, in any situation or circumstance, how does that affect your reputation? That was my little sidebar. However, I think it is still important to limit the information that online users may keep public such as real names and ages. Basically, keeping anonymity of those we study can help prevent an increase in cyberbullying and danger to the people we are studying. You know, I want to add something. We can never maintain the absolute privacy of the subjects since the data is already public on YouTube. We don't maintain privacy. We manage privacy. We mitigate the risks to our privacy and theirs. Ten. It would be very easy to violate someone's privacy if you didn't know the restrictions and the ways to prevent it that you learned in the CT training. Privacy is one of the most sacred things to a person. The most sacred things to a person. And it would be a shame to violate it on purpose or even by accident. I don't know if shame is the right word, but it would definitely be irresponsible. This assignment filled in the quote unquote zeros, those missing elements of the story that they had questions about before taking the course. Privacy is very important, studying harms and feelings we, the people being studied, are entitled to. So I think this person is speaking for the subjects that we study, that privacy, harms, and their feelings are something they're entitled to have protected. Reading the federal regulations and scenarios they gave prove that the time and place of the setting, the people studied, and where the people are studied can lead to more or less risks. All of the information is valuable and is to be worn on an anthropologist's sleeve, a little voice telling you about protecting and doing no harm. The pressure to tell and give all to an anthropologist might overwhelm somebody who felt confident before the study, causing them to feel like their privacy is invaded, even though by their consent it is not. <laughs> So even after someone gives consent is what I think this uh, particular student is saying. People still may not realize what they've revealed. Let me give you a little anecdote. You know how um, someone can peer through the blinds and see something, your blinds are open and they see something they shouldn't? You're leaving the blinds open in your home or your apartment might make you think you were safe. For example, taking off an article of clothes that reveals some part of your body you wouldn't in public. The fact that someone saw it and then they share it with another as gossip is a form of invasion of privacy. Even though you left your blinds open does not mean that someone has the right to share what they saw. The same goes with overhearing conversations. It's hard for us to not reveal information that seems titillating, embarrassing, grotesque, even though we don't think we should ask for consent. So these are really complicated issues that happen offline, and they're even more complex online. I think the training is valuable because the research we are doing is black girls twerking. By looking at the videos on YouTube, we actually haven't procured informed consent to do our research. We use the videos that these people put on public platforms to conduct our research. Therefore, it's important that we should completely make the subjects anonymous and delete the identities from the people we use to conduct the research. This is really important, and I love that it's coming from you. Finally. This training was very valuable to me because it took me five hours to complete the training and every step of the way I realized that what I considered public and normal on YouTube can also be harmful and a violation of the privacy of a subject. So that's a lot to consider. Good luck with your coding and with your analysis. Keep it simple. It's complex, but that's why you gotta keep it simple. One code and make sure you do no harm and protect people's anonymity. <laughs>